in uh, around the year 2000, uh, for a couple of years, Bonnie and I lived in Cincinnati in Ohio. And um, I got a scholarship to study at the seminary there. And it was a real privilege to head overseas to take a break from ministry. All the family lived there. Uh, went to baseball games and football games and car racing and all sorts of things. But the main reason there was study. And the college was quite large. It was uh, Bible college and seminary. So it had uh, people like me in ministry wanting to uh, go further in their studies. But also people who were doing teaching, who were doing social work. Uh, who were doing education as well as training for ministry as, as, a, as a vocation. So there's over a thousand students between the, the college and the seminary. But the trustees did a thing in their, in their commitment to education. They said, it didn't matter what course you're doing, it doesn't matter what subjects you're studying, one subject is mandatory. And it was grace, the doctrine of grace. So it didn't matter what you were doing. And so Doctrine of Grace was actually a fairly big class. And I actually found it revolutionary. Just to study for 10 weeks, you know, at a two-hour lecture on the Doctrine of Grace. And what I want to do over the next couple of weeks, I might make it two, I might make it three weeks, is do a, a summary of that. It won't be deep. It won't be as deep as the... Uh, there will be some depth to it, but it won't be as deep as a 10-week uh, seminary course. And I'll add a few jokes so you can laugh at the right spot, so that'll, that'll be fine. But I want to share with you some of the, the biblical basis of what we talk about as grace. Because if you've been in the church, you'd know about grace, you've heard about grace. But, but what's the biblical background with it? So let's go through and have a look at uh, a summary of this uh, course on grace that I did. Two really significant things have happened um, in the course of Australia since, since I've been alive, even. My parents have passed away now, but they talked about how the time when decimal currency came in, and I used to be able to sing the song that came in. Income the dollars, income the cents. Do people remember that one? To replace the pounds, the shillings and the pence. Be prepared, folks, when the coins begin to mix on the 14th of February, 1966. And I used to, as a kid, sing that song. So in that time of that I've been alive, we've gone from pounds, shillings and pence to dollars and cents, to decimal currency. Something also has happened in my lifetime, and that's metrification. When I was at school, we had to learn about pounds and ounces in terms of weights and measures and distance. I remember when the, the, the traffic signs were changed from you know, 35 to 60 kilometres an hour and all, all that sort of stuff. These, the systems that we were used to changed. One of the fundamental understandings of the Christian faith is that in the lifetime of Jesus, there was a change in system. When the Apostle Paul writes to the Roman Christians, the way he summarises it is this. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, you are under grace. Now that's, that's his shorthand way of talking about that, that change of system, that difference that has happened in his lifetime since Jesus has come. We are not under law, we are under grace. But what does that mean? In what way are we not under the law anymore? Do we not have to obey it? What does it really mean to be under grace and not under the law system? And one of the things that happens, we often revert back to the old way of thinking. And in, in, in Christian terms, even though we are not under grace, uh, we are not under law, we revert back to it as if we are. I want to talk about the law and, and, and what that means when Paul is saying we are not under the law anymore. Right from the time of Adam and Eve, God had dealt with his people, Adam and Eve, on the basis of a law. He said, 
See, there's a tree in the middle of the garden. It will open your eyes to good and evil. Don't touch it. You know, don't, don't go near it. Don't eat the fruit of it. Don't. Or there'll be consequences. So there's a law right from the beginning in the way that God dealt with people. Now, for some reason, they thought it didn't apply to them, that law. I don't know who it did apply to. There was no one else around. But uh, they thought it didn't apply to them. And they found out very quickly that there are consequences to living like that. You break God's law and there are consequences. And all since that time, God started to deal with people on the basis of his laws. He told them what would please him. He would tell them what would not please him. He told them what behavior would be acceptable. He would tell them what behavior would not be acceptable. And people would begin to know what pleased and didn't please God. And God even eventually with Moses set in stone what would be the things that are the commandments that would please him. Do, do not do this. This is how our relationship works. And Moses had two tablets of stone that he brought down that, that had that enshrined in stone, in a sense, of what the law was that God would find acceptable. So first joke, did you know that Moses was technologically advanced? He had the first two tablets that were connected to the cloud. So that's pretty incredible. Anyway, when you finish laughing, I'll move on. So the law, first thing about the law. Law is not only just in stone. The law is inbuilt in all of us. The, the, the law is something that God has not just put out there for us to know. Over time, he has put that in the hearts of every human being. And even though we need a written law, he's also put it in us. I love Romans 2 in the message version. It says, When outsiders who have never heard of God's law follow it more or less by instinct, they confirm its truth by their obedience. They show that God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without but woven into the very fabric of creation there is something deep within them that echoes God's yes and no right and wrong so right from within so for example we're having coffee and I only drink coffee I wouldn't do it if you have tea but say you've got coffee it's a nice strong coffee white maybe it's got a sugar maybe it doesn't you're having the coffee, I come along, is that coffee? Yes, I'll take it, it's mine now. And I start to drink it. And you say, well, you know, that's, you know, you might say that's not fair. So what are you doing if you're doing that? You might try to get your coffee back, but what you're doing, you're appealing to me that I have a similar sense of what's right and wrong. That, that, that you're assuming we have a common set of beliefs of what's right and wrong. And I can't say, and I wouldn't of course because I'm from Ipswich, oh I'm from Ipswich, we don't live like that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't do that. No, ev everyone knows that sense of right and wrong. Everyone knows that sense that, you know, oh no, that, that's not fair. You know what's fair, I know what's fair and we know that's not fair. And that's our conscience. Now our conscience can be seared, it can be quite wrong sometimes, we feel guilty about things we don't need to and vice versa, but everyone has that basic common sense inbuilt something, that the law is written on our hearts. We can't appeal to culture or that we didn't know that something as basic as that, don't take what doesn't belong to you because everyone knows that and lives that in, in their lives. Second thing about the law is this. The law is important, but it's impotent. It's without power. The law is very important. We, we need good laws for the good functioning of a society, don't we? Once people start to break the laws, you know, there's chaos. Another joke, it's, it's more lame than, than the other one. Bruce and Jenny, we'll, we'll, we'll dob them in. Bruce and Jenny are driving in Ireland in a taxi with Seamus as the driver. 
they come up to a red light and they go straight through it. And they go, what's going on? And Seamus says, oh, don't worry, my brother Pat does that all the time. And then they come up to another red light, straight through it, flies through it. And they go, what are you doing? And Seamus says, oh, don't worry, my brother Pat does that all the time. And then up around the corner, there's a green light. Finally, they can get through. He comes up to the green light, screeches to a halt. What are you doing now? And Seamus says, oh, my brother Pat might be coming the other way. <laughs> See, once you start to break the rules, you're a danger to you, you're a danger to the society. So the law is important. We're not... You know, even in Paul saying, I'm not under the law anymore. We're not, not saying it's not important. It is. But it's impotent in the sense that it lacks power. It has no strength. It can point out what you're doing wrong. It just can't make you do it right. You know, that's not its job. If, you, if you know, you're hiring a, a cleaner, she says, I don't do windows. If you're hiring the law for a job, he says, no, nah, I don't make people good. I can point out how bad they are, but I just can't make them good. That's not my job. I don't do it. The law can point to righteousness. It just can't produce it. The law can show us what godliness should look like. It just doesn't make us godly. The law can inform us of what's wrong, but it can't transform our lives. The law just does not have that power and you can tell people all day long what they're doing wrong but the, by the law by itself cannot make people do it right Paul says in the book of Romans Romans 8 and verse 3 for what the law was powerless to do he talked about no condemnation the law was powerless to do God did for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, weakened by the sinful nature of people, God did by sending his own son. So the law is important, but it's impotent, it's powerless. And the third thing is that the law is impossible to keep. The law is impossible to keep. Some people get the idea because there were 10 commandments and we get, you know, a pass mark is just over 50%. That we, even with the 10 commandments, we get the idea that we can take the best six, you know, the easiest ones to follow. And even if we get a 51% pass mark on those, you know, we'll be fine. But the law, when the Bible talks about the law, it talks about it as a single unit. It's not the 10 commandments, pick six out of 10. It's the law. It's the one whole thing as a body. It's a unit. So if you're breaking one thing, you're breaking the whole thing. That's what James says, James 2 and verse 10. James, the brother of Jesus, when he writes, he says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Again, we get the idea that if we were to you know, break the law, we can appeal to the fact that we haven't broken it sometimes. It sort of evens itself out and, and it's okay. And if you believe that, try that next time you go through a red light or get caught speeding. And when the police pulls you up, just say, well, there were times that I didn't do that. Does that balance it out? Try to argue that in court or try to argue that to the policeman. It doesn't work. You're not that good. Let's go back to what Paul said again as, as he's writing to the Roman Christians. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. Now I've been pretty loose with the way I've used the word law in, in what I've just said. In fact, I've used it three ways and if you listen back to this and and, and listen to it online or have a rethink. I've used law three ways. Law can be a set of standards. It, it's, it's the moral code. Law can be that source 
of safety and stability for a society, that we need good laws for society to function. And law can be used as a way of salvation. It's those things that we do whereby we're put in a right relationship with God. So law is, is used and Paul uses it and the Old Testament scriptures use it in different ways. It can be any one of those three. So have a think. I won't ask for a call of hands. But when Paul says we are not under the law anymore, which one of those three does he mean? And I, I think this is really significant, even to, just to understand that phrase, we are not under the law. And I hope in your minds you've said the third one, because that's right. Because if we said the first one, oh, we're not under the moral code anymore. We don't have to do anything. We can get forgiven and live any way we want. We're not saying that. Oh, we can become a Christian and the laws of society don't apply to us. We're not saying that. But the law as a way of salvation, as a way to be right with God, we are not under that old system anymore. And in one of the greatest pieces that Paul ever wrote, he said this in Romans 3 and from verse 20. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Not that it's not possible, but you're just not that good. You know, I want to be nice to you even at Westside, but hey, you guys aren't that good. And no one is that good. Theoretically, that might be possible, but no one can live up to that. I mean, we haven't even gone to the definition of sin being, and it's not just the bad things that you've done and breaking the law, even the good intentions that we have and don't do, that's sin as well. So we haven't even gone there and thought through that. So Paul says, no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law just simply points out how sinful we are. Verse 21, so significant. Circle it, do whatever you can in your notes. But now, but now, God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. What a wonderful truth. We are not under the law in needing to follow that exactly all our lives. And most of us, when we get to that realisation, it's too late anyway. But we are under a new system of grace to be made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus. That's what grace is. And that's what system we are under now. It can be portrayed like this. I've got it on a, on a graphic. So if you're using the sermon notes on the Uversion app, it won't, the animation won't appear, but the final product will. So this can, can illustrate the law system. And there's two pairs of things. And the first one is that when you keep the law, it leads to the fact that you will enjoy the blessings. And that's good. That's fair. We like that. We like having the blessings. But it's got another pair of things as well that's a bit more difficult because it says if you break the law, that leads to suffering the consequences. And that is the law system. That's also fair. That's totally fair. And we need that. I'm not saying the law is bad. And we need that. And I've been talking with people through the week about you know, the importance of parents giving their kids consequences of what happens when we break the law. And the Bible says, Paul points it out in Galatians when he's writing to that group of Christians. He says, those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under a curse. For the scriptures say, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. Consequently, it's clear that no one can ever be made right with God by trying to keep the law. 
But there's another system. There's another system that we're under. There's another system that we're operating under, and that is in grace. And grace has the same pair of things. They're just arranged a bit differently. Someone who has kept the law has suffered the consequences. And those of us who rely on that system, those who have broken the law, get to enjoy its blessings. And that's the grace system. And that's where the cross comes in. Because Jesus, who was the only one who has ever kept the whole part of the law and did it perfectly in word, thought and deed, paid the price, suffered the consequences of all the sin that we have committed so that we could enjoy the blessings even though we haven't obeyed the law. And that's the grace system. That's what grace is about. Now, as I said before, there's been a change in our system in Australia in the time that I've been alive. But I still hear echoes of the old system. People have a bet and they say, we'll have two bob each way. Or a baby's born. How big was it? It was seven pound five. Or it was 3.3 kilos. How tall are you? About six foot? And so sometimes we still talk in the old system. It's a couple of miles down the road. Give them an inch and take a mile. Give them a centimetre, take a kilometre. Doesn't sound quite as good, does it? Or you watch Wimbledon and you watch the Hawkeye. Oh, it was out. It's a game of inches. It's a game of centimetres? I guess that, yeah. But we, we, we still, we're in one system, but we talk in the other system. And I think what Paul was getting at, even in saying that phrase, we're not under law anymore, but under grace. He said, don't sin because of that. Don't, don't live in one system, but sometimes we revert back our mindset, our attitudes, our values, our behaviours are still stuck in the law system. We're under grace and every part of grace. But we still talk and think and act and react to people as if it's the law. I was thinking about this through the week and I just thought, it, it, it's people. So, so sometimes I've just talked to so many Christians over the years who are so worried about their own salvation. They're worried that they're not good enough. Not worried that they, they're worried they don't deserve it. They're worried that somehow God's got a curse on them or God's punishing them because of something. And this is law thinking. This is nothing to do with the system that we're in. And, and, and they're afraid and they're, they're not sure if they've, you know, haven't written to their grandmother this week that they'll go to hell. And, you know, it's just, it's just such a law based thinking rather than being under the freedom that grace. Sometimes it's the way we treat each other. People say, oh, he, I'll do that because he deserved that and they deserve to be treated like that. And It's all about deserving rather than out of grace because we, we're in the new system but we're acting as if we're in the old system and, and we need to get out of that. So what I want to do in wrapping up, just, just real quick, and we'll finish with, with communion this morning. What I want to do is just share just an acrostic on grace, that if we get grace, if we're living in this grace system, what does that look like in practice? Because that, that's the thing. I, I really believe a lot of behaviour should have a, a, a real strong belief and, and, and a biblical basis to them. But it doesn't just stop there. It then changes and, and, and translates into the way that we live and think and act. So if we get grace, if we really understand it, if we, if we really comprehend it, if it goes from the head to the heart as well, what does that look like? I'm going to do another Captain Obvious. So the first one, those who give grace, those who have received grace, give grace. People who get grace, one of the characteristics is they have grace in their lives. They're gracious people. They know they've been given it and they don't mind giving grace to other people. They don't treat people 
as they deserve. They treat them better than they deserve, like God has treated us. Their conversation is gracious. Their, their treatment of other people is gracious. People might not deserve to be treated like that, but they treat people graciously because they have got grace. That seems the most obvious thing, but Christians should be the most gracious people in the world because we operate under that system. R is for rejoicing. We should be rejoicing people. The prophet Joel in the Old Testament said, Rejoice, rejoice you people of Jerusalem. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for the rains he sends are an expression of his grace. And people who get grace are rejoicing people. They see the positive. They are rejoicing in God because they see so many expressions of grace around them in their lives. They see the rains that God gives and the sunshine that he gives and the family and the friends and the blessings that we have received in our lives as expressions of grace everywhere. And so they rejoice. A is for accepting. They are accepting people. They follow the scripture in Romans 15 that they accept one another as God has accepted you. And they say stuff like there, but for the grace of God go I. I could have been like that if I didn't have the upbringing I had. And so they're accepting of things, not accepting of sin necessarily, but they're accepting of other people and their journey in life. Brennan Manning's one of my favourite authors and actually went to a spiritual retreat with him. It was, it was brilliant. He says, Christians are the most non-judgmental of people. They get along well with sinners because they're aware of their own lack of wholeness, their brokenness, and the simple fact that they don't have it all together. Sometimes I think we, we're too judgmental of other people. We think other people's sin is really bad and ours is just okay with God. We just forget that other people are sinners too, like we are. They just sin differently to us. C is for confident. And I don't mean confident and arrogant and proud. They're not confident in their own ability. But people who get grace are confident in their relationship with God and don't have this burden of, I might be saved and I might not. They live out what John said. We looked at John's gospel last week, John's letter. He said, I write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life and that you have confidence in approaching God. And people who get grace are confident in their relationship with God. And they know that things will happen to them. But they are confident in who they are in Christ and they can keep going. And they are enduring. People who get grace are enduring people. They don't give up early. They don't take their bat and ball and go home. They keep going. And there will be things that happen to them. And those that don't get grace, that are burdened down by the law, and play life like, pardon me, Tomic plays tennis sometimes. And, oh, I'm, I won't win, so I might as well not even try. They know the burden of the law is so great. And maybe they're so far behind, they, they won't even try. And they give up early, or the burden of, of obeying the law is too great. But people who get grace are enduring, and they endure all sorts of things. They don't give up or give in or drop out. They never get to the situation of someone hurting them to the point that they won't keep on going because they've got the grace of God. They've grasped it. It's inside them. So I just pray there might be one or two of those things there that you can grab yourself, that this, with this understanding of grace, that you are no longer under the law as a system of salvation. You no longer have that burden, but you are under grace. And there'll be one of those things that you can grab in your lives. Last word in the sermon today goes to Peter Drucker. He's a management guru, just one of the, the most brilliant minds uh, ever to, to walk on this earth. And he talked about employees being the um, company's greatest assets and a whole lot of really radical in those days management things. And, and he just revolutionised the whole idea of, of the subject of management and practice 
He picked the rise of Japan and the, and the economy way back when you know Japan made in Japan stuff was junk and and just how it, it, it rose. And he was just a brilliant guy. He spent a lot of his last years doing management research and help for non-profit organisations, particularly churches. What people didn't realise was he was a Christian. He was asked why he was a Christian and he said this. When I finally understood grace, I realised I was never going to get a better deal than that. You'll never get a better deal than grace. And you don't have, to have, don't have to be the smartest man in the room or the smartest woman in the room to understand that. You'll never get a better deal than the fact that, that God has promised you his salvation because of the price that his son paid for that on the cross. It's free. It's not cheap cost Jesus his life but you will never get a better deal than that and I just hope you know you can live with that in understanding and grasping grace we're going to finish today with the Lord's Supper and sometimes when people do the, the, the communion talk there's a particular emphasis that, that we give when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper he said something that would be trying to think of what it would be like for the disciples it says he took some bread and gave thanks and he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me and that would have been strange enough because his body was right there like it wasn't but then verse 20 says after supper he took another cup of wine and said this cup is the new covenant new covenant now we know, know about the new covenant we just talked about that not under law but under grace but for those who heard it for the first time maybe they know Jeremiah Jeremiah talked about God said I'll make a new covenant one day and I'll put the law in their hearts but there was no such thing as old covenant or new covenant it was just the covenant like saying in World War One, World War One, because they didn't call it World War One back then. It was just the Great War, and then there was a second one, and that was one, and that was two. And Jesus here, amongst people that only knew the one covenant, the covenant, said, "There's a new deal, fellas. There is a new covenant. This is the new deal." And it would be based on grace and not the law. And the old deal, theoretically, it was possible for someone that was perfect to meet the requirements, but practically no one was. In the new deal, anyone, anyone could experience grace. In our systems that we've been talking about, they got foisted on us. We didn't get a choice. We just, it just happened. Between the old and the new covenant, we get to have a choice. And as we celebrate communion, as we do every week, those words of Jesus, this is the new covenant in my blood. An agreement confirmed with my blood poured out as a sacrifice for you. So as we share in the Lord's Supper this week, and we would, as we do every week, ask people, if you love the Lord, you're most welcome to share in this time. You don't have to be a member of the church, but we want people to participate in this. And this is the new covenant. Remind yourself today, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. If you know the significance of this, then you're not under the law anymore, you're under grace. This is the new covenant. And I have a new way of thinking. I have a new way of dealing with people. I have a new understanding. I have a new everything about me because Jesus said, this is the new covenant. So the helpers will come up in a minute and pass the trays around. I ask you to take a piece of bread 
and you can eat that straight away. Take the cup at the same time, but uh, just hold the cup and we'll drink it together. It's a great sign of unity to, to drink it together. And we'll remember that this is the new covenant, the new agreement that Jesus made, signed in his blood. So it will help us come as I, as I pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the new deal that we've got. Thank you for the new covenant, the new agreement, the new arrangement that you made that enables us to walk with confidence and, and freedom and Lord, it's just a wonderful thing. And Lord, I just pray we would get past thinking about the law and whether stuff's fair or not or whether we deserve it and whether we're arrogant because somehow salvation is something that, that you've given us. But it's all by grace. And Lord, I just pray that by eating and drinking this morning, remembering that grace was incredibly costly because someone who didn't deserve it took our punishment. Someone who didn't deserve it suffered the consequences that we should have had. And by that has bought our freedom. So as Lord, we eat and drink this morning, I just pray we'd have a new appreciation of the wonderful thing that grace is in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name.